God, I pray like the Apostle Paul that, uh, that we would know, experientially know, uh, the height and depth and breadth of your love that goes beyond knowledge. It goes beyond us totally wrapping our heads around. So may we go deeper still into this today. God, please, we need to hear from you. Help me accurately represent your heart for us. Thank you for the powerful word of God. This is your word. Give us ears to hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. All right, so the, the topic this morning is love. Love, right? It's like, oh, it's great, you know? Most people love talking about love. They sing about love. They tell stories about love. They watch movies about love. But when you look at all that and you listen to everybody talking about love and you watch love on the movies and you hear it in the songs that are sung, um, don't be surprised if you find love confusing. Think about this. I, I, I find you know love is quite confusing. I mean, think about it, right? Somebody says to you, I love you. What do they mean? <laughs> I love you. All right, what do you want? <laughs> right? I mean, what does love look like? What does love look like? How does love treat another person? How do I know if I'm in love? Are you in love? I don't know. I think so. Can two different people have two very different ideas and concepts of love? Could, in fact, someone love me and I not recognize it? I mean, that's what happened with my parents. My parents told me they loved me. And then they told me no. Oh, come on. I thought you loved me. You know? My, my father told me he loved me. And then he told me to bend over <laughs> while he paddled me. What's up with that? I'm confused. Right? A girl has a boyfriend, he says, if you love me, you'll have sex with me. Watch the movies, two people fall in love, it's automatically in the bed. A friend maybe confronts you, says, hey, can we get lunch, can we get breakfast, and so you sit down with them, and they hear they're going to talk to you about something. I need to talk to you about something. And they call you out on something they think is wrong. And it feels to you like they are not being very loving. This is kind of an unloving thing. This feels judgmental. It hurts. You're offended. But they claim that they love you. This is confusing, isn't it? Love is very, very confusing. So it, we're out there and all these things about love and understanding of love and confusing of love. And then, and then you come to church. Are you ready? You come to church and then somebody like me gets up and says this. You ready? God loves you. But what does that mean? My guess is if I took a microphone and started going down the aisle with every single person and I'll say, does God love you? Yes. What does that mean? You may get lots of different ideas and understandings of what this means. Have you ever heard someone say, if God loves me, he sure has a funny way of showing it. I've heard people say that going through a very, very difficult times. Other times people say this, I, oh, I, I, know that, I know God says what I'm doing is wrong, but, but he still loves me. And you go, wow, what kind of, what kind of love is that? You know, what, what, you know, that seems kind of strange. Is, is, it, is that love kind of like, you, you know, 
your mother going, whatever makes you happy, dear. Today, today we're going to push the reset button on love. Our view of God and what He means when He talks about loving us. We're going to give Him the mic when He says, I love you. And we're going to do it by looking in the book of Ezekiel. We're in a series in the book of Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 16. That's where we'll be this morning. It's on page 702. If you didn't get your Bible on your phone or you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's one in the, in the rack in front of you. It's on page 702. And I, I encourage you to make sure all of you are looking at a Bible, whether it's the rack or your phone or whatever, uh, because we won't have any of the verses on the screen this morning. So Ezekiel chapter 16, and, and this is a love story, and I, I want to set the thing up. Ezekiel, if you haven't with us, Ezekiel is a prophet of God. Now, what a prophet means is that they don't come up with their own material. A prophet from God doesn't come up with his own material. He gets it from God. That's why a prophet always says, thus saith the Lord. So what you're going to hear through Ezekiel is God and he's telling a love story. Now Ezekiel is talking to people who in their current situation are wondering what God means when he says, I love you. They are confused. They are confused. Why are they confused about God's love? Because they were exiled Jews sitting in Babylon. They were ripped from their homeland. It was the promised land. God promised that land. God promised these blessings. God promised this stuff. They were God's chosen people. The capital city was Jerusalem. That was the beloved thing. There was this the identity they all had with the city. This was called the city of God. And in the city of God, Jerusalem was the temple of God. And, and that's where the presence of God, what he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dwell there in the temple in the Holy of Holies. And the glory of God settled down into the temple. And now that was all gone. The refugees in Babylon were going, if God loves us, He sure has a funny way of showing it. Hmm. The refugees were, were kind of saying things like, you know, if this is how, if this is how God you know, treats the people He loves, I sure don't want to be His enemy. And so God is going to push the reset button on their view of love. Over 60 times, we said, in the book of Ezekiel, God kind of pushes the reset button and say, okay, look, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say this, I'm going to set this straight, I'm going to act this way, and then you will know I am the Lord. I am the Lord. So what he's going to do is tell a love story. He's going he's gonna to put the reset button on, on what it means when God says he loves him. And he's going to do it with a love story. And it's their love story. He's going to go back and say, we have a love relationship, you and Jerusalem, you and my people. And he's going to go back and tell their story. And he's going to tell them how he, how God sees the relationship. Now, I have to warn you. This love story in Ezekiel 16 is, is not a Hallmark style, Hallmark Channel style. Uh, you know, this isn't going to be on a Hallmark Channel, okay? All right? It's, this is God telling us what He means by love. God's going to tell us what love looks like. And you're going to be stunned at how tender it is. It's an amazingly tender. Not sappy tender like the Hallmark Channel. This is going to be amazing tender. And he meets people in incredible woundedness and brokenness. And his tenderness is amazing. And it's, this love is beautiful. And it, it's also intense. It is also passionate. It is also, you ready? It is raw. I will warn you ahead of time that in this love story, it will be rather graphic. There will be moments when you're reading through the story 
when you'll be tempted to check the front cover of the book and make sure, is this really in like the Bible? My guess is you will probably leave here. There's a good chance that you will leave here and you will not be the same. There's, there's a good chance that it, at the end of this love story, it's very likely that you won't respond ever the same way again when you hear the words, God loves you. Are you ready for a love story? Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. You say, well, that's Jesus in the manger. Well, that's how they treat children when they want to take care of them when they're born. But that's not how this child was treated. No, no, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out in the open field. This is what they did in ancient times when they wanted to get rid of a child. Newborn child, didn't want it, abort it, whatever. They just take it out in the field and leave it. You were cast out in the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, Live! I said to you, in a, live. And then I made you flourish, and you grew like a weed, like a plant in the field, and you grew up and you became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Chapter 1 of the love story is the unwanted child. The unwanted child. God goes back to how they met. God goes back to how they met. God is doing the history of the relationship and how and where the relationship began. He says, your origin and your birth. Well, the origin and birth was not exactly a royal pedigree here. In fact, it's interesting Bible scholars debate about who the mother and father were. You know, it's like, okay, your mother was the, you know, your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite, and so they're going through all this stuff about the city of Jerusalem, how it was born, and, and, and all these things. And it, he, he, look, here, here's the point. Here's the point of the love story, okay, for us. This was the newborn child they found in the dumpster. We're always shocked by that, aren't we? I'll never forget the day my sister called me. She had just, she had just buried her three-month-old baby boy. He had, was born, lots of struggles at birth, and three months later, Benjamin passed away. And I remember her telling me on the phone, Dan, I just saw a news story about someone who left a newborn in a dumpster, and I don't, I don't know how to process this. Mm-hmm. So this baby, uh, you know, who are the parents? Well, we're not sure. One thing was sure. One thing is obvious. Nobody wanted this little girl. Now, sometimes when, sometimes when you hear, sometimes when you're in a setting and someone says, God, God loves you, you know what we think? We think, well, that's nice. You know? God loves me. Um, we're not real surprised, if we're honest. Um, if we're honest, it's not like shocking news that God loves us because we, we think we're fairly lovable, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a likable guy. We took some cute baby pictures, right? 
And God says, no, 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 no. You were the unwanted, deformed, aborted, left in the dumpster to die child. And then God came along. Chapter 2. Rescued by the prince. Oh man, hang on. This is, this is incredible. So, verse 8. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you are at the age of love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. What is this? This is a, you might remember the book of Ruth. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, an ancient uh, way of communicating that, look, I, I want to engage in a marriage relationship with you, and this is my, my promise. I will protect you. I will love you. This was that kind of a, kind of a gesture. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. They got married. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, there's love, and everybody loves, you know, you should love your neighbor and love your neighbor yourself and all that kind of stuff. But, th but this was different. This is marriage love. We all understand that it's different, marriage love. Sometimes people living together say, why don't you get married? Oh, it's just a piece of paper. But they fool themselves because they know it's not just a piece of paper because marriage is like, well, you're going to get married because we all understand intuitively that to get married is a commitment. It is what the Bible calls a covenant. I mean, it, what, what, what does he say there? He says, I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and now you're mine. See, yeah, God loves everybody, right? He loves everybody, but listen, he has a special covenant love relationship with his chosen people, Israel. He also talks in the rest of Scripture that he has a special covenant love relationship with those who are born of God, who are saved, who are children of God, new creations in Christ. It's different. Let me explain it this way. You know, I, I love all the women I meet. You know, first service, my wife is down here, and she's going, there better be more of this story. But, I love all the women I meet, but, listen, I have a covenant love relationship with only one woman on this planet, and it is Holly, because she is my wife. See, at the age of love, this story, at the age of love, Holly and I made vows and she became mine. And I became hers. See, this is covenant love. This isn't just like love the person on the street. No, 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 no. And God says, so this is an amazing relationship that they're entered into. They've been rescued by the prince. Do you know that if you have a salvation story, if you, if you have have been made alive, it's different, you're different. This love that you have with God is very different because you were dead in your sins. You, you were out, left to die, wallowing. Your, you were dead in your sins, but God made us alive in Christ. Live, He said to us one day, right? And He forgives us, and He cleans us up. And He says to us, now you're mine. You're mine. See, do you understand if you're a believer that, that the New Testament calls us the bride of Christ or the bride of Jesus? You're mine in a very special, unique, uh, covenant relationship of love. And man, does God treat His bride well. Does God ever know how to love on His woman? Look at verse 9. 
Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered it with silk. Nothing but the best for you, baby. I mean, the clothes, the shoes, the whatever. It, he just lavishes her. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. You know, Zales, I own Zales. And I put a ring on your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, the only the best of food, fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced in royalty. Wow, God knows how to treat his bride well. He just lavishes her. Come on, baby, I'll just, you know, you, you're, my, you're mine. The New Testament says that those whom God has saved, those who he has rescued, that we are now sons. We are heirs. We're royalty, Galatians chapter 4. And it's his children and salvation. He lavishes us with the riches of his grace. 1 John 3 says, is stunning. 1 John 3 says, see, see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. This is an amazing rags to riches love story. See, Jerusalem, Israel, the Israelites, they didn't come to a love relationship with God. They didn't, they didn't come into this like the old English movies where there's a dowry and the woman goes, well, I'm bringing a lot into the marriage. What are you bringing into the marriage? You know what we brought into the marriage? You know what they brought into the marriage? Nothing. Nothing. We brought nothing into the marriage. God gives us everything. 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you did not receive? And God initiated the relationship. It's not like we were going, oh, maybe he'll pick me. It's not like we're the little ugly duckling going, oh, I hope God loves me. I hope he marries me. No, 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 no. We were off chasing all our other lovers. We didn't like God. We didn't want God. We were doing our own thing, chasing our own stuff. No, he loved us first. He came looking for us. He's the one that drew us to himself. See, if we have any kind of love for God in our hearts, it's because 1 John 4 says, we love him because he first loved us. See, in salvation, God pours out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we can love him back. The only way we would ever love God in this covenant love relationship is if he makes us alive, and we're born in his love. First John talks about that. This is an amazing thing. Verse 14, I love this. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Unbelievable. This is an amazing story. The unwanted child rescued by the prince, married and lavished with his love. I mean, she's living the dream in the palace. Chapter 3. But, uh-oh. Chapter 3, there's trouble in the dream marriage. Verse 15, but, but you trusted in your beauty and played the whore. Yeah, I'm good looking. I like this. I like how, I like how guys look at me. I like how this is. You know, I, I enjoy it. You know, I'm, I'm turning 40 and these young guys, you know, we, Because of your renown and you lavished your whorings on any passerby, your beauty became his. God's going, what are you doing giving your beauty to him? You, this is me. You're mine. I'm your, we're, in this, we're, we're married. 
Verse 16, you took some of your garments, which God says, I happen to give you, remember? Uh, You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines, and on them played the whore. The like has never been, nor ever shall be. They took, it was happening in Jerusalem, they took the blessings of God, God blessed them with material blessings, they took those material blessings, and the gifts became idols. They took these gifts, and they used them in their pagan sacrifices. God goes, I I gave you that. What, what, What are you doing? They love the gifts rather than the giver, and their love ran around. Verse 17, hang on, verse 17, you also took your beautiful jewelry that he gave all the beautiful jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given you, and you made for yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. Now, they've translated this and put it in the Bible from the original Hebrew, and they've really, really made this as nice as possible. What's going on here is the women in Jerusalem are involved in these very highly sexual pagan practices. They're taking jewelry that they had, and they're making him, yeah, the closest thing. Basically, this is masturbating with pornography. That's what's happening. You made yourself images of men and with them played the whore and you took your embroidered garments to cover them and then you set my oil and my incense before them. You know, they they were burning oil and incense to all these pagan gods. God says, "I, I gave you that stuff. Verse 19, also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey, and you set before them for a pleasing aroma. And so it was, declares the word. Has food ever become an idol with you? God has blessed us so much with food, and we make it an idol. Verse 20, and you took this really... And you took your sons and your daughters whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? What in the world was going on, you say? In the city of Jerusalem, in the city of God, they were taking their children, God's chosen people were taking their children and sacrificing them to the altars of Moloch and other foreign gods. They were sacrificing their children, child sacrifices. And God says, these are my kids. These are my kids I gave to you. Apparently something meant more to them than the life of their kids. We all struggle with these things, right? We can, we can love and you can find yourself chasing wealth, find yourself chasing power, find yourself chasing habits and hobbies and a drug high and another marriage. And what happens to the kids? What about the children? What price are they paying? Larry Nasser is certainly in the news. The Olympic girls gymnastics team doctor. Sexually abused. What was 150 women went through the courtroom and told their story about him. And I was watching this very, very carefully because I was watching for how quickly it would spread the focus would spread from Larry Nasser to all the other people around. And it has spread. And here's what I mean. All of these girls are coming through and so many of them were saying, we told our parents. We tried to tell the coaches. We tried to tell this person. We tried to tell these different adults. And no one believed us. 
You know what? The haunting, haunting question. There are many of them. But one very haunting question is this. Were these precious little girls sacrificed on the altar of Olympic glory? We're the U.S. Olympic team. Verse 22, And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and wallowing in your blood. You forgot all about where you came from. God says you forgot all about where you came from. You forgot all about it. Have you forgotten how I loved you, God says? Have you you forgotten all I've done for you, God says? When did I ever treat you bad? When did I never, in the utmost love and grace and shower you? When? 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 Chapter 4. Chapter 4. The justification for tough love. Uh, You might not think this is very loving conversation, but this is what God says. Verse 23. After all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square, at the head of every street. You built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination you know it's just like all the street corners in jerusalem the places you know like a times square kind of a thing everywhere it's go there's these pagan uh uh um, Im- pagan images and 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 all the gods that they chase it was just like it was godless and they You offered yourself, verse 25, again, you offered yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. Again, the, as they translate the Hebrew into English, they, it, it, you know what it means in the original Hebrew? It says you spread your legs for anybody who would come by. Verse 26, you also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger. And the people are like, God's angry? Well, listen, listen, I thought he loved me. Listen, listen, listen. The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is apathy. Of course he's upset. He loves them. Verse 27, Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. God's chosen people were out partying the pagans. And they were going, man, did you see them? They're crazy. Now, we, we thought we invented partying. They're crazy. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them and still you were not satisfied. You multiplied your whoring also with the trading land of Chaldea. And even with this, you were not satisfied. You're not satisfied. Listen, sin does not satisfy. There are the fleeting pleasures of sin, but then you're left with bitter consequences, and death. And God watched His bride destroy herself. See, our idols, listen, our idols, the things that we say, well, that's where I'm going to be happy. That's going to give me satisfaction. And we run into all these things. They always over-promise and under-deliver. The idols of power, money, sex, they always overpromise and underdeliver. Psalm 37 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And God's saying, Man, you're married to me, man. I give you anything. I, I'm, I am the answer to your heart. You, I'm, I'm your, your soul's best thing. 
Verse 30, how sick is your heart, he says, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square. Yet you were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. God says, listen, at least a prostitute gets paid. You're out there sleeping around with anyone and in fact paying to have some guys do it with you. Verse 32, adulterous wife. Can you hear the passion? Can you hear the pain? Can you hear the adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband? It's the same kind of passion you hear in James chapter 4 when God says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You know, ask any couple, you know, you know, you know, so, you know if, uh, ladies, I'll ask you, you know, if your husband comes home and says, hey, you okay if I, you know, I've got a relationship, I met somebody else, can we kind of, you know, can we kind of do a dual thing? You mind a couple, you know, I'll, I love her and I love you, can we kind of do, and you know what, I don't think so, <laughs> right? And, and you know what, that doesn't work with God either. One commentator said Jerusalem was a spiritual nymphomaniac. Wow. So God's going, that's enough. That's enough. Verse 37, Therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those who loved and all those you hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. And I will judge you as women who commit adultery, and shed blood are judged and bring you uh, the blood of wrath and jealousy. I will give you into their hands. Verse 40, they shall bring up a crowd against you. You know, when, when sin, we run with our sin and then it implodes on us. It's a way of imploding on us. Verse 41, they shall burn your houses and execute judgments upon you in the sight of many women. I will make you stop. I will make you stop playing the whore and you shall also give payment no more. Verse 43, because you have not remembered. Listen to God's heart. You did not remember the days of your youth, but you enraged me with all these things. Therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord God. See, God's love, God's love will not look the other way while we carry on with sinful, self-destructive behavior. He says, we're married. God is not an enabler. God is not the person that says, well, you just follow your own heart. You do what you think is going to make you happy. No, God's way smarter than that. He's way more rational than that. He's, he just knows too much. and So His love is deep and it's strong and it cuts through all the ridiculous talk. And He goes, no, listen. And it's tough. And He says, you're going to stop this. Hebrews chapter 12 is a passage that we... Um, often wonder about, and it's because we don't understand God's love for us as His children. In Hebrews 12, and you've forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. The Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastens every son whom He receives. Yes, my parents did love me, and that's why they said, bend over. <laughs> right? So where are we with our story? Does it end here? It certainly looks like it's over. This marriage is over. This relationship's done. Does God's love run out? Does God's love get cold? Does God get to the place where he said, okay, that's it. I've had it. No. Chapter 5. Stunned by God's tenacious, tenacious, steadfast, never gonna let you go love. Hang on. 
no hallmark story ends like this. Verse 59, Thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant. God says, I'm going to deal with you as you have done. You promised to love me. I promised to love you. You've broken the covenant. You broke your oath to me. But yet, verse 60, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. Do you hear what God's saying? He's going, look, you made some promises to me and you haven't come through on it, but I made some promises to you. I promised my love to you and I will never stop loving you. I will never let you go. See, God says, I will remember my covenant with you. I remember my covenant with you. You know, hang, hang on, folks. You, you'll never go to communion the same again, right? At communion, you get, you get this? At communion, we lift the cup. And what do we say? We quote Jesus' words, like the Lord said. And sometimes you've been through communion so many times, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, Lord, uh, drink it up. Uh, what time is it we're going to go? You know, you, 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 you lift the cup. And what do we say? This is what Jesus says. He says, this cup is the new covenant In my blood, whoa, we're married. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. Whoa, whoa. And God says, Jesus says, I'll never forget the covenant relationship I have established with you. Verse 62, I will establish my covenant with you and then you'll know I'm the Lord. This is love in a way we can't wrap our heads around, right? This is like, wow, this is love. Like Verse 63, I love it, that you may remember, oh yeah, and be confounded, and never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I atone for you, when I come after you and die for you and pay the price of all, when I atone for you, all that you have done declares the Lord God. What more could God say? God demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet whoring around, He died for us. That kind of love, my friends, will leave you stunned. That kind of love will leave you confounded. That kind of love will leave you humbled and speechless. If you're a believer this morning, if you have understood that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, and whatever level of which you understood, you understood that you were a sinner and didn't know how much, but you knew God loved you and, and that there was forgiveness when you put faith in Jesus Christ. You understand at that moment, He, t- he took you from, from death and made you alive. and He cleaned us up and now we're royalty. We're His And He has poured out His love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can love Him back. And He says, now abide in us, man. Stick with me. It's a sweet, sweet thing. And we are chosen by God. And we have to understand, we are in a covenant love relationship. We are the bride of Christ. And so, as we close... I want want to tell you something. God loves you. (laughs) Are you kidding me? You think about that. You think about his tenderness. You think about his tender love. I brought nothing, had nothing, was wasted, unloved, unwanted, and He came along in all the brokenness and the mess and the sin and the junk. And He said, you're going to be Mine. 
You're mine. And then He lavished on us all the riches of His grace. And His, his love is incredibly tender. His love is tough. His love is tough, man. There's no way. There's no way. You know, he loves us just the way we are. And He can never love you any more than He loves you right now. He's in a, you're in a covenant love relationship with Him. You know what? But He loves you too much to leave you that way. So when we get lazy and flip it, and, and God goes, do you have any idea all that you could experience in knowing me and loving me and following me and obeying me and, and, and becoming more and more like Christ? And He's so committed to us enjoying life like we've never enjoyed it before that He's tough you know, we say, oh, he is going to tell us no. And he's not going to passively look the other way when I go whoring around. He's not going to do that. He loves me, man. Am I ever glad that he loves me? Because my heart, my flesh is constantly pulling me after all these other lovers. And, and God says, no, no. You really don't want to go there, and I'm going to come after you. I'm glad. You know what? This is like the marriage. If it wasn't for God's love, we wouldn't still be together. And His love is tenacious. It is the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's the unfailing love of God. It's who can separate us from the love of Christ. It's like the old hymn, O love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in Thee. I give Thee back the life I owe, and in Thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Oh, to be loved by God. Let's pray. Father, um, I don't know, you know all the people that sit here and exactly where they are, and I don't know where they're at. I don't know what understandings they have of your love for them. I don't know if they're here loved by you like you love every creature here on earth, but maybe they're not in a covenant love relationship with you. Maybe they're not the bride of Christ yet. I pray that at this moment they would come running to you. Listen, if you're here this morning and you, you go, wow, I'm that unwanted child. God comes along and He died for you and you can, by faith, embrace Him as your Savior, as your King. He will rescue you. He will give you life. He will say, live! And He will engage with you. He will make you His. You're mine. And you're in a very unique, special love relationship with the God of the universe. If you came in here this morning and you are already a believer, um, I don't know what God's telling you this morning, but you listen to Him as He speaks in His still small voice how He loves you and what that means for your life. Father, we are stunned, we are ashamed, we are um, confounded when we hear that you love us. But we're so glad. In your name we pray, amen.